<clears throat> one of us actually is a woman. <laughs> Thanks for showing up on <laughs> so early on a Saturday morning for this. I didn't know if we'd have 10 people here, like if anybody really gave a damn about this. We care deeply about it because it affects us on, on so many levels. And um, each person up here is here um, because I think they can speak to a different part of what is um, somewhat of an impending, as, well, the word I just used backstage was apocalypse. Uh, and um, so let me just tell you who we have here. Um, down at the other end is a man by the name of Bill Hill, and this individual um, has uh, set up, and, and he, has, he is in charge of all our projectionists since year one of the Traverse City Film Festival. And he... He goes around the world and does this. He's got this crackerjack crew of, of people that he so he brings them with him, um, uh, and uh, we've known him for a long time. And just a, a very generous, huh? Oh, it's a radio going. Oh, sorry. Um, very generous <laughs> soul. Um, next to him is um, a man who uh, co-founded um, Boston Light and Sound. And this has been, for decades, uh, you know, one of the, if not the premier place uh, to go for all kinds of things from um, uh, 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 projection and theater systems to, uh, actually, I told you a long time ago that the first time um, I, I was dealt with Boston Light and Sound was putting on a concert in Flint back in the, uh, that must have been like the late, uh, late 70s, um, where the band needed the equipment, and they said you can only use Boston Light and Sound uh, for all the lights and sound on the stage. So, so Chapin Cutler has been um, with us also from the very beginning of this festival for all eight years. Uh, they're based in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> And he also, um, anybody who does festivals, anybody who's involved in the film industry, um, uh, he is sort of a godfather of, of, and everybody knows him, and uh, he is the go-to person to consult with if you want the absolute best picture, sound, and film-going experience, Chapin Cutler. <laughs> uh, next to him is um, a, a, a filmmaker uh, who, um, was in a film that we had here two years ago, right? You were here, you didn't come with Lena though, okay. So Lena Dunham, uh, who now has a show on HBO called Girls, if you haven't seen it, it's an incredible show. Um, she came here two years ago with, was that her first film, her first feature? Or? Uh, yeah. It was her second, but her first wasn't released, so they called it. I see, okay, it's called Tiny Furniture, I don't know if anybody saw it. And, and, uh, and you were in it. Um, and, uh, and he's also in Girls, uh, the TV show. Um, uh, but Alex is also, he, he's both an actor and a filmmaker. Um, he's, in, he's in two films here uh, this week, Red Flag and Supporting Characters. And he is the uh, uh, writer and director of Red Flag. Um, and, uh, and so Al I've invited Alex here because um, as an independent filmmaker, um, uh, this changeover that's taking place um, could put a huge stake in the heart of uh, of independent filmmaking, but um, you know, I'm, I I have um, watched a couple of other Alex's films this year. Uh, this is someone you're going to hear uh, from in the coming years, and you'll be able to say that you were here on this early Saturday morning and got to meet him, uh, uh, Alex Kropowski. The man next to him made a really good documentary that we have here called Side by Side. And uh, did anybody see it yesterday? Oh, good. Okay. <clears throat> well, he sort of lays out uh, the situation and talks to a number of filmmakers, uh, those who are pro-celluloid and those who are pro-digital and those who are a combination of both. And, and uh, it's, it's really a, a wonderful overview of, of where the discussion is at right now. And if you have a chance to see this film, uh, uh, please check it out, side by side. Christopher Kennelly. <laughs> the genius to my right, <laughs> who, who is from Belfast, so that's not an oxymoron. <laughs> I just said that for Terry George's sake here. So. Uh, 
Uh, Mark um, has made a 16-hour uh, documentary. In addition to being a very well-respected uh, respected, uh, uh, film critic and essayist um, and, and filmmaker, he's made this 16-hour film called The Story of Film. We're showing it um, uh, eight hours today and eight hours tomorrow over at Dutmer's. But we showed a couple pieces of it over at the Old Town this week for those who didn't have 16 hours um, uh, to give to it. But if, when it comes out on DVD, I really encourage you to buy this film and watch one of the most fascinating, um, I hate to call it a history lesson because it's not that. It's a, it's, a, it's a poem, a love poem to cinema and to those who love cinema. And, and he takes you on this ride that does not follow a linear fashion, even though it looks like uh, Channel 4 in, in England made you, you know, do that. Okay, here's the 18... Whatever I don't know, but it, but but he'll he'll jump back and forth and all around, and you'll be in the 2000s, and and suddenly you're back watching Laurel and Hardy in the, in the 1930s. Um, but Mark has I just I just want to encourage you to watch this film when you can, and and we've had some great discussions, and um, he has a lot of thoughts about uh, where this is going, and 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 how this is also going to affect not just those of us in this country, but because there's so many great films that come out of the third world. Uh, what this means in terms of, of is this going to be good or bad? Are we going to no longer see these great films from other countries? We see so few of them anyways. Even if you live in New York or L.A., it's rare that a foreign film gets a run now at a theater, so let alone, well, I won't say Traverse City, because as you know, we do <laughs> runs of foreign films. And uh, the Iranian film that won the Oscar this year, uh, A Separation, will begin next Wednesday right after the, uh, the festival is over. Um, but uh, so anyway, so please welcome Mark Cousins. All right, so let me get things going here, and we're going to kind of mix it up. We have various feelings about this. Uh, we agree, we disagree, we're very passionate about this. Um, uh, and then we're going to invite you uh, uh, to join us uh, in this discussion. Uh, <clears throat> about four months ago, I received a call from the Film Society of Lincoln Center um, saying that uh, this is their 50th anniversary of the New York Film Festival next month. And they are going to show a few of the films from their 50 years. And one of the films they're going to show is Roger and Me, uh, leading up to the festival. And, um, and this was, of course, this was a big moment for me. This was the moment that Warner Brothers saw the movie. They saw the eight Bennett standing ovation, and we sold the film to them, and it was, you know, a great thing and all that. Um, <clears throat> so... They, um, they called, and they wanted to know if I would come. And I said, yes, of course, sure. Uh, they called back a few days later, and they said, oh, we don't know how to tell you this, but um, there's not a single showable print of Roger and me anywhere in the world. They're all gone. And the ones that exist are all pink or cut up. And it, it was just a crushing thing to hear. Um, and so I hung up. And I called the people at Warner Brothers, some of whom are still there from when Roger Me was, was there. I said, can you help me with this? You know, um, he, they said, no, we, we actually got the same call from the Film Society, and we looked in all our archives, and, and we're already on this. Uh, and if you want, you know, we need, actually, we were going to call you, so if you can participate, yes. Can we restore this, and can we make some prints? Because Kodak had just filed for bankruptcy. So you can see the writing on the wall here. Um, then I read the story where the a company uh, in this country that, that makes 35 millimeter projectors has stopped making projectors. And the company that makes 35 millimeter cameras has stopped making 35 millimeter cameras. And the two labs that, pr that um, develop 35 millimeter film, Deluxe and, and Technicolor, have essentially merged into some kind of conglomerate of their own as they try to save themselves and make and rapidly trying to make the switch to digital. So, and uh, so you know ro they're willing to do that at Warner Brothers. There's still a demand for the film. There's still money to be made, and none, none of this would happen. They're not a charity. They wouldn't do this. You know they're doing it because they, you know they, in the future they think that, that I'll still make films and people will still want to see my other movies. Um, but for other people. <laughs> Who don't have that kind of muscle of Warner Brothers behind them, uh, I I think that this you know we're going to have a big problem here, in just the just the uh, preservation of our movies. I told the story backstage that um, we took a lot of pictures of our daughter. She was uh, born in um, you know eighty one, 
in, into the, you know, digital came in. Uh, then we got a little digital camera. Uh, we stored the pictures uh, on a floppy disk. Um, last year, we pulled the drawer. There's the floppy disks. We went all around. You know, we thought we might have had something. That we had nothing to put the floppy disk in. <laughs> so then we started calling around. Well, there must be places that do this. And I'm sure, I'm sure you guys probably can tell me where. Do you, can you tell me? There's probably a place in New York, but I don't. No, this was in New York. I was calling around in New York. What's a floppy disk? Never First, heard of it. Uh, yeah, what's a floppy disk, right? And, and those pictures are gone. You know, you know, the answer we all give, right? If your house catches on fire, other than getting the humans and the pets out, what's the one possession you would grab if you could grab it? The family photo albums, right? This is gone. We made this switch because digital, wow, this is cool. Hey, it's easy. And, and uh, I can just print it right here at home. Um, gone. Um, the digital the equipment that we're using, the digital uh, a tape that we use now to make our films on, will not be the same technology five years from now or ten years from now. And the machines that play them won't be here. And you're going to see a, a whole swath of film that will be unavailable to you from this 10, 20, hopefully no longer, 30-year period. I think this is really tragic. Um, so I just want to, I'll start by throwing that out, and, and Chapin, you probably want to jump right into this. And then, and then we're going to also talk about, you know, is this good or not for the technical end, of, you know, in terms of making a film, digital versus, um, and the money uh, involved. And we're also going to talk about the fact that places like the Bay Theater in Sutton's Bay and thousands, how many, Chapin, of small theaters? Um, the estimate has been up to 10,000. Small theaters who do small. not have a digital projector. And there will not be a single Hollywood movie released on film in 2013. So if your theater, um, uh, <laughs> I'll let you talk in a second. I know, I know, I know. Um, <laughs> If your theater is a small theater and you have movie projectors, a digital projector costs anywhere from sixty to seventy-five thousand dollars. They don't have that money. You're going to see these theaters close in these small towns, all across the country. And even though the studios will say, "Well, we're offering them a payment program," we'll talk about that. But, but I mean, this is so. It's so so. A filmmaker like Alex. Films like his, you're not going to be able to see them. You're not going to see the small independent movies because the houses that show them aren't going to have the projectors, and they're probably going to be out of business. Um, uh, there was a, a, a theater owner here last night from a small town in Michigan. He had promoted the fact that The Dark Knight was coming for a month. Um, all he has is 35 millimeter, and he ordered the 35 millimeter. And then three days before, they said, no, we're, you know, we don't have any really any more 35. We have to, you have to take a, a digital. We don't have a, I don't have a digital. So he didn't get to show uh, the Batman movie. And this has happened to a lot of these, these mom and pop theaters are going to get completely run out of the business and, and we will all suffer as a result of it. Mr. Culler. My wife accuses me of talking too much, so I'll try and make this short. First of all, um, I do have a camera that shot originally on five and a half inch floppy disks. I can't get the disks anymore, so I tell you what. I'll send it to you, and you can copy your own <laughs> stuff off of it. <clears throat> That's an example of why collectors should never run their own businesses, because they never throw anything away. Um, and you've said so much that I've forgotten most of it. But um, the, the, <laughs> the National Association of Theater Owners and uh, the DCI Consortium has backed off on the 2013 because they realize that they're pushing themselves into a corner. Uh, and where they originally had said a year ago that they were not going to ship any more 35 millimeter prints after the 1st of January 2013, they're saying, well, in the next couple of years, we're not going to do that. Uh, the second thing is, of course, the thing that's ironic about The Dark Knight is that The Dark Knight was shot entirely on film, almost entirely in 70 millimeter, partially in IMAX. And Christopher Nolan, uh, the director, is one of the major proponents of continuing to distribute and make movies on film. Uh, his premiere was done in IMAX. 
Um, I would tell you that uh, at the National Association of Theater Owners Convention this last year where the major studios bring in uh, portions or pieces of the content that they're going to be distributing through Christmas, uh, Christopher Nolan uh, insisted that the five minutes of Dark Knight that was played at that convention be played on film. It was the only piece of film that was run at CinemaCon. After the event was over, I started asking people. I said, hey, you guys were here for the Warner Brothers presentation. Um, one of those pieces of content was on film. Can you tell me which one it was? And to a person, they said, well, we know it wasn't Dark Knight. <laughs> and the bottom line is that uh, although I have to take some pride in the fact that we tend to make pictures look better no matter what the source is, than a lot of people seem to be able to. Um, Dark Knight was the best looking piece of material in that entire presentation, which included an awful lot of real high-end um, material. So, you know, it's not an issue of what looks better and what looks worse. It's really a case of how the content provider, the filmmaker, wants their film to look. Um, and I'll... Uh, Oh, and one other thing I would like to add to his five and a half inch floppy disk. How many of you have seen I Love Lucy or a piece of I Love Lucy on television within, say, the last five or ten years? How many of you have seen Mr. Peepers on television in the last five or ten years? How many of you know what Mr. Peepers is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I recognize all of you because you're as old as I am. <laughs> <clears throat> Mr. Peepers was a sitcom that was out in the late 50s and early 60s at exactly the same time that I Love Lucy was on. The difference is I Love Lucy was shot on film. Mr. Peepers was shot on videotape. And there is no machine that exists that was around in 1960 that can play it back. And the tape is disintegrated. I would also make another point. I'm sorry I am speaking too long. Uh, in the tsunami a year and a half ago, the plant that Sony makes all of their videotape or their high-end videotape was destroyed. Uh, and what's happening now is the tapes are being recycled because they keep going on and offline. The same tsunami destroyed the plant that makes the high-end digital uh, uh, videotape machines, the ones like we use right here. And so what we're ending up having to use is existing inventory. And the entire, the entire uh, tape format as a professional uh, either recording storage or playback device is disappearing exceedingly quickly. So the black hole that Michael talks about is here. It's on us. And um, I turn it back to you. Um, what, uh, Alex, maybe let me ask you. Um, um, I assume you, your films that I've seen were shot on uh, digital. Yeah. Um, um, maybe you could just explain to the crowd too the difference uh, in uh, you know if there's anybody here that doesn't understand the the technical what the difference between film and digital what we're talking about here, and and why you chose digital when there still is film available and and what your concerns are as an independent filmmaker. Um, yeah, I made uh, five films that are all shot on digital um, in one form or another. The last two are on high definition. I chose it because. Uh, you know, the financially, I couldn't shoot on film. I mean, it wasn't even close. Um, these, the movies that I made were for all, all of them were for under $20,000, which would get you nowhere, basically, if you're shooting even on 16 millimeter film, much less 35 millimeter film. So uh, they also allowed me to kind of get away with uh, a smaller lighting package, uh, a smaller crew in general, and there's less machinery to kind of, to nurture and to keep in mind. Um, so that's sort of why I did it. I was sort of financially restricted. And I could have, you know, done what some of my friends did, which, which, you know, a more conventional path, which is try to package the movie together, um, spend six to six months to infinity, you know, fundraising it and, and going around doing that. I'm just an impatient person. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to tell the story. I wanted to tell it uh, on my own terms, and I want to tell it quickly. And that was one of the main reasons why I went with them. Um, video and, and you know going to film festivals here and there I would say 95 to 98 percent of the films are on video in fact if someone's I, I found that uh, films get into film festivals because they're shot on film 
uh, you know, it seems like it's, there's such a huge premium placed on it now that a lot of people don't even pay attention to the merit of the film, the quality of it. And Can I just add, yeah. in our film festival this year, um, of the 100, how many films do we have? Almost 200? I'm told around 200, yeah. Don't have a final count yet. Four are on film. That's all we could only get. We want to show film, but we could only get four on film. Sorry, Alex. Yeah, no. Um, so it's such a rarity that I think a lot of people program a movie that's shot on film, even if it's a piece of, piece of crap, just because it's on <laughs> film. It's like we need, we need to somehow worship and preserve this strange, decaying dinosaur. Um, <laughs> some of the worst movies I've seen at festivals are shot on film, I have to say, just because um, it's become a gimmick in, in a weird sort of perverse way. Um, so yeah. And going, going back to what you're saying about you know, this uh, mom and pop movie theaters, this guy who tried to show Dark Knight, that movie theater would never show my movies because I've never been in a financial position to make prints of my movies. My, none of my movies have, have, have um, ever gone on to, to be exhibited in film. So these guys, these really mom and pop operations who only have 35 millimeter or, or any type of film projectors would never play my movie anyway. So it's hard for me to join into the swan song in that particular aspect because I want those people to get digital projectors so they'll see my movies. And as an aside, most people don't see my movies theatrically anyway anymore. It's all VOD um, and DVD. And DVD is dying too. It's pretty much all VOD now. Right. The great thing about digital uh, projection and distribution is that filmmaking, which is probably one of the most expensive art forms so, over the last X number of years, 100 years or so, uh, because of everything involved, when I made Roger me, you, you could only shoot you know 16 millimeter, but it was $400 for every 10 minutes to for the film and the developing. Um, Can I bounce in for a second? Yeah. Um, before we get too far into this, I would like to make one sort of quick clarification and definition for you. There are two different formats that are used in movie theaters, like this one, like the state, like all the film festivals that we do. Uh, one is high definition video, which is tape format, which you can buy the tape, you can buy the machines, you can buy the projectors, you can install them anywhere you want to, and you can run any piece of content that is on that particular tape. Then there's digital cinema. Digital cinema requires a special projector, a special playback. Uh, it had its content in use in movie theaters is encrypted, so it can only be shown in that theater during that time period. Alex's movie probably will not exist as a digital cinema content. I say probably, but on the other hand, almost any uh, theater can install either a DVD or Blu-ray player and a projector and run that image. So Alex's picture is more apt to play in this little theater somewhere in northern Michigan than The Dark Knight is going to play as digital content because his material is going to be distributed either high definition or standard definition, uh, and the cost of setting up for that is significantly less expensive than setting up for digital. So theater. what you're saying is the smaller theater will be able to afford a Blu-ray machine. There yeah. are theaters out there that basically right now uh, are set up to run high definition out of Blu-ray, and they exist very nicely. Uh, but they're not running first-run content. They're not running Dark Knight right now and won't be able to run Dark Knight until, you know, whenever it's released on Blu-ray. Um, however, independent distributors will distribute on Blu-ray almost immediately, uh, and some of them distribute 35 millimeter high definition video, Blu-ray and DVD at the same time. So you can find a small independent theater that will be playing a first run movie on Blu-ray in their facility because they're not worried about the copy protection because their movie is never going to be cop is never going to be copied and sold in front of Radio City Music Hall for two dollars. So, Alex, uh, just to underscore what you were saying before Chapin um... interrupted. <laughs> Digital has taken the art of uh, filmmaking out of the hands of those who have a lot of money and can only afford it, or, or they know somebody with money, and put it in the hands of really any artist who wants to make a movie. And, and, and in a sense, will perhaps, and has perhaps, given voice to 
um, um, middle class, working class, even the poor. So you, their stories can be told in the cinema um, because of the, for the reasons you just stated. Right. Yeah. Um, Chris, that that's a huge point. You know, the democratization of filmmaking. Film is great, and everything I grew up watching that inspired me to make movies was shot on film. But like you said, I also there's also a lot of crappy movies made on shot on film. Um, digital doesn't matter where you're from either. It used to be a geographical thing. If you weren't in kind of New York or Chicago or LA or had access to get there, you couldn't really print your material or finish it or color correct it. And now, you know, if it's truly about telling stories or capturing footage and sharing it with the world, maybe not, you know, in a theatrical sense, but being able to create a movie and put it on the internet or send it out somehow, we're in, in a totally different world than we were in with the older technology. But, okay, let me, let me play devil's advocate with, the, with this. Yes, yeah, so it allows, so now anybody can make a movie. So that means now anybody can make a movie. Which is great, I think it's great. So, <laughs> really? so, it, so oh. the, the viewer, okay, maybe yeah, there's but, more stuff out there to filter through and it's a little bit harder, but. Oh, I think not. it's really. You're, you're on your th computer and you can. I think it's real. You can communicate with other people and find out yeah. what's good and it rises to the top. Where in the past, you know, you'd, there was a few critics and you'd read it in the paper and you were kind of hoping that, you know, you liked the same movies as Roger Ebert or something and you go there and maybe you didn't. And you wasted your money and you had to show up at a certain time on a certain day and spend your money and you're out of luck. Um, we had uh, Searching for Sugar Man here as our opening night movie and it opened last Friday in New York and LA. It did very well in LA but not as well in New York which is surprising and I said to Michael Barker the head of Sony Pictures Classics when he was here this week how did that happen? Why wouldn't New York respond to this? He said because because there is a glut of of especially documentaries the IFC now is um, putting out a film a week. You know, the, the Miramaxes and the Sony Picture Classics and the Fox Searchlights, they put out a dozen, maybe, well, Harvey, maybe two dozen a year. But, but they're putting one out, one, at least one every week. And there's, so there's this, and, and like people all ask me, why don't you take submissions to this festival? I say, well, I'll tell you why, because Sundance gets, what, what do they get now, Bill? How many submissions? 8,000, 10,000? They told me 8,000. 8,000. How do they even go? We would never be able to watch all that. And, and, and even the, the few hundred that, that we ask for or get, I mean, it is, I'm just stunned that, that um, people think because they can sing in the shower, that they can sing. And it's, it, it's like, I don't, isn't any, don't they have family members or friends or somebody telling them, you're a good person, you're smart, we love you. Accounting is a, is a, is a, is a, a respectable job. Bill, what, you want to say something here? Um, where do I pick up that one? Um, <laughs> I don't know, you see, it seems like maybe some of the craft of the art of filmmaking or image capturing or whatever you want to call it in these days is being lost because everyone is a filmmaker because they can sing in the shower or something. So you see maybe a lot of things out there that um, maybe shouldn't be out there even though they're not shot on film. I don't know. but. Um, we're talking about a couple different things here, I think, in, in, in the it's made it more democratic for people to capture the image, but it's not so democratic when you get to the exhibition part of it, because from my understanding of the uh, major multiplexes are being funded by J.P. Morgan Chase because an exhibitor cannot take on that kind of a debt to get into this equipment. And um, the contracts are saying that if you put digital projection, if I'm gonna buy this digital projector and put it in your movie theater, you have to take out your 35 millimeter. That can't be there anymore. And I think that, I, I don't understand why they, well, I understand it's economic. Why isn't that, why isn't that illegal? I mean, why isn't there an antitrust uh, issue there? Uh, I'm wondering the same thing. And I'm wondering why uh, maybe there isn't some sort of a groundswell of, of uh, independent theaters that 
could get together and I, do, I think a lot of it too is that theaters because now we own a theater so I'm, now I'm, I'm also an exhibitor so let me I'll just say one thing about that we, we wanted to have coke in our concession stand um, but diet coke sucks people like diet drinks and but diet Pepsi sucks less so <laughs> people in town said can we have diet Pepsi but you can have your regular coke great let's get them both oh no coke says here's the answer <laughs> Coke says, no, you cannot have Pepsi products in here. And they're Coca-Cola, right? They're like the bullies that are telling these theaters, get rid of your 35 millimeter, you can't have our digital projector. And we just said, we just said to, to uh, Coca-Cola, and people for listening to this on public radio right now, cover your ears, we just told them to <laughs> And you can, either, you can either sell nothing here or a lot. But, you know, you're not going to tell us what other drinks we uh, can offer. And you can go over to the State Theater now, and you can have a Coke and a Pepsi right there <laughs> coming out of the that State That must theater. be the only theater where you can. <laughs> it's not, I just think most people don't, it, Spike Lee, I heard him say this a long time ago, because um, he was, he was, in the early years, he was very much on black, famous black stars for not insisting on, a single black crew member being on the set. I mean, there's, this is all white operation. And, and, and he would tell these individuals, I won't mention any names, you know, you have a lot of power. You're like an A-list movie star. You can actually say, you know, you're gonna have to go out, and if you don't find them, you're gonna have to train them, but there's gonna have to be people on this set who are of African-American descent. And th it will happen if you say it. But most people are, somehow don't say it or are afraid to say it, so. Um, I've saved you for last uh, here um, um, uh, because I wanted the, this thing to kind of run the gamut of the various issues. And of course, we've not talked about the issue of storytelling and is digital good for just the, the art of what cinema is really about. It's not really about the technical thing, although that's important to all of us and whatever. But, um, but, the, but the actual art of storytelling in the cinema, does, is digital helpful? And I'm just curious because um, you have lived and breathed this stuff now making this film for six plus years so you have made this f thing called the story of film um, during the exact time that this revolution has happened so you must have a number of thoughts about this uh, you use the right word revolution we are right in the middle of a revolution in cinema however I passionately believe that it's a social revolution and a technical revolution but not not an artistic revolution you've been talking about apocalypse and, and tragedy and a black hole I must say that uh, that dark imagery doesn't quite coincide with my understanding I'm more of a kind of I think there's more light in the sky I think the art of cinema is not being changed by digital, here's what, here's what I mean. When cinema was born, it had this fantastic impulse to reality in the first documentaries, but also to dream, dream, dream-like qualities. Uh, so cinema, one of the reasons I love the art of cinema is that it's real and dreamlike at the same time. And I think digital has not changed that proposition at all. If anything, it's made cinema more realistic. A film that we saw here last night, a masterpiece called Five Broken Cameras, incredibly realistic and honest film shot in very simple digital technology. But if you also look at the other, the dreamlike qualities of cinema, films like Avatar, for example, are as dreamlike as cinema can get. So I think that all that, all that the digitizing of the film process has done has exaggerated the innate qualities of the medium. So I'm happy about that. Um, so I think the, the first order question is, is the art of cinema being affected? My answer is no. But any, when you drop to the second order about social and technical things, I'm going to be optimistic about this as well. Um, obviously, in, in America you, obviously in America you have a particular problem in this question of how you fit your, your your, refit your cinemas. Uh, I'm sure you know in other parts of the world, in the UK, for example, the government supported something called the Digital Screen Network, the DSN, and provided roughly £25,000 to a theatre uh, to put in a proper digital 2K projector. That's socialist. <laughs> socialist. Um, I was going to say the same thing. This, this, this happened also in other countries about which you might see, say the same thing, like Sweden, of course. Well, most civilized countries, yeah. I want to say that. 
And what, what was the, what the, the requirement in order to receive this £25,000 to put in a digital projector? You needed to submit a good business plan, but you also had to commit to show a range of cinema from around the world. So that was very good. Um, and obviously, obviously we need a kind of funding revolution, something like a Google Books or something, an international uh, plan to make this happen. But another, another positive aspect of the di digitizing process, I spend a lot of my time in West Africa, in India, etc. And I have seen so many small mobile digital cinemas bringing films to, to, to uh, all across Mauritania, Senegal, etc., to Mali, to, uh, to bringing films to villages. And the same in India. The, 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 the mobile cinema circuit has been reborn because of the because of the digitizing of the film process. And just sticking on India for one more moment. India, there's no national cinema. India has made more films than any country in the world, um, including this one. Um, no national cinema is more in crisis. No cinematic heritage is more in danger than India's because the film prints are not being properly kept. Um, so the digitizing of the film image will at least be as much of a help and advantage as a disadvantage in a country like India. So uh, that's broadly my position. I didn't hear I, all that, but I think digitizing, <laughs> excuse me, Michael, oh, if I can I was just me. feeling good all of a sudden, so. <laughs> but the digitizing of something that originated on film and then exhibiting it that way changes the quality of it completely, I think. Um, last year at the State Theater, we during the film festival, we had a restored print of an old B Western, a Roy Rogers movie. That was an incredible experience to see that on film. And it's a, such a different experience. When your eyes are resting 24 times every second when you're watching film, it's a completely different experience than when you're watching it digitalized. Um, there is... Um, um, well, hang on a second. You disagree with that? I, maybe I'm maybe I'm just not a good enough looker, but I I don't I don't see that. You're, you say it's completely different. I just don't see that complete difference. I've seen I've seen uh, Meet Me in St. Louis restored and sh and and projected on a 2K projector recently. The great Vincent Minnelli. Film. I don't know. I and, I, I and do. Maybe just, I'm just a dinosaur, but I I do see the difference, and I, I kind of equate it to uh, maybe going to a museum and seeing one of the old Dutch masters. And you, you might see a Xerox image of it that is beautiful and the colors are gorgeous and it's bright and it's wonderful. It's not the real thing. And if something originated on film, I think it should be exhibited on film because it is a completely different quality and you can, I guess, um, debate what quality is, but um, it's a different experience watching it on film. I, I think it is a, a personal thing. I mean, for Side by Side, we interviewed about 140 people and some of the top cinematographers in the world, you know, from Storaro to Vilmos Zygmunt and, and, you know, guys who've been around since the 40s and the 50s, almost every single one of them almost preferred the new digital projection for their movies. They say, you know, when they, when they make something in the lab and they print it on film, it looks great at Technicolor and Deluxe and it's a perfect pristine print off of the negative, but by the time they create 2,000, 3,000 prints and, and the negative gets worn down and it goes out to Minnesota or wherever, well, let me, also it gets... Yes, but let me say, again, and, and Chapin, I know you can jump in on this, you're gonna... The, the uh, digital, okay, yes, it's not gonna have the scratches that film will have uh, after it's played so many times, but you all know this from your own home stuff, that the information, the ones and zeros sometimes, after a certain period of time or whatever, um, it, it, you know, we've had a number of problems showing things digitally where it just <laughs> And you have pro I mean, there's always going to be, unless Chapin's doing it, there's going to be, you know, projection Yeah, but the problems. difference is, is that when, our, when the film broke, and the film used to break, sometimes it would burn right in the bulb and you'd watch it on the screen. You know what? What Bill and any projectors just take it out, splice it, <laughs> start the projector again. You know, you have not lost the movie or the movie experience. Uh, Chapin, yeah. Sometimes you'd burn a piece of film in the gate just to see if anybody was awake. <laughs> um, the issue for me is not, you know, I've seen an awful lot of horrible 35 millimeter 
shows shown um, in movie theaters. Um, I don't go to the movies very often because I can't stand it. Um, <laughs> however, uh, a badly set up digital cinema projector that's set up by somebody who's never set a projector up in their life and they have, uh, uh, they have uh, the, uh, the, the time from midnight to 8 a.m. to get six of them set up, um, their results can mean that every show in, of every movie will not look very good. And that's part of the problem with digital is there's nobody there to either correct it, fix it, make sure it's done right, it's all done quick, and it's all done speedily. Um, my issue really with digita digitization of analog product has little to do with what uh, Vittorio Storaro does with Apocalypse Now because Vittorio Storaro will sit in the DI room with the colorist and he will make sure that the results that are projected on screen are exactly what he wants them to be. What about James Wong Howe? Who's sitting in the colorist room to make sure that his movies look the way they should look? Nobody. You have some kid who's fresh out of film school. I'm sorry, that's probably a bad thing to say. But somebody who doesn't have the understanding of old movies sitting in a room with a colorist who has a bunch of dials and saying, I think it should look like this. And so what we're ending up with is films that have content that was shot day for night. It's supposed to look like night. It was shot to look like night. They're saying, well, that, that, that looks kind of blue. I think we should brighten it up. And by the time you get done, you get a nighttime scene that looks like it was shot in the middle of the afternoon. And that's really my objection to it is not so much, uh, oh, by the way, um, when uh, Perfect Storm came out, it was run digitally. Uh, it was a transfer from a scratch 35 millimeter print. And so every digital print that ran in every movie theater was scratched just like film. I thought that was carrying the film look a little too, mu too far. <laughs> I would also say that I once had a conversation with the guy responsible for prints for Warner Brothers Universal, whatever that consortium was, in which I said to him, you know, um, have you guys ever experimented with taking a color print um, and that's on S-Star Stark and, and photo guarding it so it won't scratch? That was a process that basically encased 35 millimeter film uh, kind of in a, in a plastic, kind of like a sheet protector and it basically uh, prevented scratching. I said, have you ever thought about doing that? You know, people are putting in the cheapest projectors they can get and the cheapest rollers they can get and they put them in a dirty environment and they give them to a, you know, to a, to a high school kid to run 18 of these things. Have you ever tried this? Yes, he says, I have tried that and I have six prints of, of uh, Gremlins 2 down in the vault and I'm not quite sure how long they're going to last and I don't know what to do with them because they're too good to throw away but nobody's ever going to look at them again. So, there, I mean, the whole, the whole gamut of where we've come from and where we're going to and the death and, and life of 35 millimeter, almost, aside from the creative thing, has more to do with uh, how to make the most money and protect the content the best rather than the, the, the art of how a movie looks on a screen. Um, the, uh, b before we lose the momentary high that we had with what Mark, <laughs> with what Mark was offering us here, uh, I, I want to go back to that. Um, because uh, I think you are right, and Chris, I want you to, to jump in on this. Um, we, uh, there are films being made now, you mentioned five broken cameras last night, shot on used, old little tiny home video cameras. Absolutely one of the best films uh, of this year, not just best documentaries, one of the best films of, of this year. Um, and, and he is not a filmmaker, he's a Palestinian farmer. His, his skill is farming. Um, and he made one of the best movies of the year. And he would never have been able to do that um, if he had to use film or even the huge, the, the red camera or the high end, you know, high definition stuff. So, so you're right. I mean, the, and this is going to put it in more people's hands. It's gonna, it's, uh, it's not. It, it, it's a move from an autocratic art to a democratic. That's correct. And, and, um, 
and as much as I love film, I only shoot in, in digital and have and, and Bowling for Columbine was the point in 2002. Actually, we started we started shooting 1999 on 16 millimeter film, and if you watch the film, half the film is on 16 millimeter, and half is on digital. And we made the switch in there, and I haven't gone back because it's just a lot easier to run away from the police when you have to light <laughs> the digital cameras than the film. So, so uh, Alex and, and Chris, I, I mean, this is, uh, I, I would like to, you, if you have any response or anything you want to add on to what Mark said about, uh, this is not the apocalypse, it's not all doom and gloom, and when we're talking about the art, the actual art, the movies, you know, not the, the techie part of this now, but just the, the movies, this, this revolution could lead us into this decade in, the, in a profound way. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I think, sympathize very close with a lot of what Mark says. There's a lot of me that does feel good written, and, and let, let's sort of open it up. And there's still gatekeepers. I think everyone, you know, we're talking about people singing in the shower. There's still gatekeepers. Hopefully, there's people who program at film festivals, and hopefully the stuff that is worth showing will, will be seen, and the other stuff will be blissfully forgotten. Well, I'd like to add something kind of close to what Mark started out saying, you know, when we are talking about the question you posed to him about storytelling, the actual art um, of the storytelling nature of it, just to kind of put in two cents from my acting pocket. I think there's been a, so I've acted in about 25 movies or so. Three of them have been on film, in 16, 16 millimeter film, one on 35. All of them have pretty much been comedies where we hope to do, well, depends on the director, but hopefully there's a lot of improvisation, or there's at least an opportunity to do improvisation. The tone on set between, a 30, between any film and any uh, digital um, experience is incredibly different. Um, especially with comedies, because you can't screw around when you're shooting on film because it's so expensive. So the, the leash from which you can improv from is much tighter, it's much shorter. Whereas if you're shooting on something that costs virtually no money, you know, the tape costs no money, uh, with these um, video cameras, you can improvise for 30 minutes in a row and get into a real weird groove and hopefully go into really fun and weird places. The TV show that I shoot on now, uh, Girls, we shoot on a on video camera, on a, Alexa, a video camera, but we can shoot uh, several cameras at once. We can keep the camera going for 30 minutes, 40 minutes. It's great for everyone, you know, except for the boom operator, maybe, because his, <laughs> his hand gets tired. But, uh, but it, and that, 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 that sort of, that is a revolution, I think, in, in terms of how loose you can get. In film, the few, the few movies that I've done that have been on film, everyone gets very serious when it's time to roll. These are low budget operations. Every minute is so expensive. We have to do it. It just requires a lot more. Um, I don't want the, to say focus because the I, tension, though, there's tension. The tension on the two, the difference in tension on the two sets yeah. is Crazy. incredible. In, absolutely, because with film uh, and the and the producers there, the money people, it's there's just you are the clock is ticking, um, and in order to light it and to be able to turn the camera around because you're not shooting on three or four cameras, uh, you can. I, I mean, you can if you have a lot of money and all this, but. Um, it, the half hour to 45 minutes it takes just to turn the camera around to get the reaction shot. Um, you're using that 30 to 45 minutes to, hey, let's try it this way, or let's improv that way, or let's, maybe it's going to be funnier this way. You now have extra time for the art exactly. and the content of the story. Yeah, exactly. And it's, and it's made a huge difference. I mean, it's, it's just, just seeing it from one side to the other. So that has been a revolution, I think. Uh, Chris and then Mark. I mean, that's the... the huge benefit of digital is that it gives you freedom due to the cost and the ease of use and the lucky thing is that you know the the great image makers of our time the cinematographers and the directors they're actually taking the time to make sure that this new tool is not inferior to film you know it's arguably side by side right now, or, or film might be better, or digital might be better, but it's another tool right now, and storytellers and movie makers have a choice, at least right now, maybe film will no longer be a choice, and that's kind of the fear, and that's kind of the debate, but I think the advantages of digital are just, they're just amazing. You know, your friend, uh, Lena, we interviewed her, Lena Dunham, and she was like, I probably would never have made a movie, I would be a writer, because I was intimidated by the technology and I didn't have the money to do it. So just the mere fact that, you know, these movies are out there and we can watch them now, it's because of the technology. And to me, that's an so, amazing thing. 
So this is another uh, great point, and I've seen this too uh, in uh, with friends and people, um, film sets I've been on or, or people I know, uh, that this has uh, demailed uh, this by uh, because film is we know how to take the engine apart and put it back together, and digital. Maybe there'll be a woman up here next year. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, because digital, yes, because digital is. Um, you'll see not with documentary filmmakers we have, or there are more women than, than there are men, um, um, because the the technology now doesn't have this big keep out sign on it, and um, so that is going to be a good thing. And I, I was just going to make a point. I don't know if this is relevant, but. I just passionately believe that cinema is young. You know, there's a danger of having a conversation as if it's a, it's the, it's dying or it's like a funerary or conversation. Cinema is an extremely young art form. I've met people who made films in the 1920s. It's just, it's just getting going. I think you know, and and it's not modern. no, no, it's not. And so I think that's it. It's it's it is danger about being. The danger is about being bleak about cinema when it's really just, it's like a little stream that's just starting to bubble. I don't, I don't think it's dying. I think it's just changing. And I think that's a good thing. Okay, oh, uh, here comes just... the negative perspective again. <laughs> uh, sorry, Michael. Um, I agree with you that as a tool, digital is fabulous. I mean, pictures like, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings and, and you know, the, the Batman movies and all those things that were that have become part of our modern culture would never exist uh, as they do without digital technology. Certainly as a tool in making movies, it's something that should be supported. And in all phases of digital technology being used to either make or exhibit images, we're in the Model A Ford era. And I don't mean the Model A Ford of 1931, I mean the Model A Ford of 1903. Um, that we don't know where this is going to go. We don't know where it's going to end up. Technology reinvents itself. It has to. Otherwise, the people who are doing technology go out of business. But the thing that worries me is we now have the ability to send high-quality images anywhere. And to almost any, at this point, high-quality almost any device. And so we have an industry in which as the point was made earlier, where video and demand is being released to people who want to pay $60 rather than uh, going to a movie theater, and they can sit and watch it at home. Well, the economics are, if you happen to have a family of, uh, of four, and uh, maybe you got a couple of neighbors who want to say the same movie as you do, you can save the cost of going to park, you can save the cost of your tickets, you can save the cost of your popcorn, and it's a deal to sit at home and watch a movie. And to be honest with you, I'm again, not wanting to be a naysayer, but what we're seeing right now as a result, and it may be more of a symptom, I don't really know, but given the fact that content that is delivered into first-run movie theaters is being done digitally or electronically. Uh, the fact that the analog copy that you really had to have your hands on in order to be able to run no longer exists. There is nothing to keep the major distributors who are looking to make, get a recut, or, you know, get a, a get a recoup their costs as quickly as they can because they have to pay interest on the $175 million they just spent on Superman 8. That I actually believe that as much as we love cinema, there is a real possibility that the distributors will say, okay, we're going to distribute the movie at the same time. Why are people going to go to cinemas? And we can all sit back and say, oh, that's because I get to sit next to this noisy person and the guy eating popcorn and the guy next to me talking to each other. There may come a point in which we're not quite as happy to have a communal experience and would rather have a communal experience at home. Sorry. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to be the Mr. Happy-go-lucky happy here, but um, <laughs> um, I, 
I think this, the desire to come together as a group of people and, and have a communal experience predates cinema. Uh, more people are going to music festivals than any time previously. And I think the, this human desire to get together in a room and laugh and everything, it, is some, it's an innate desire that won't go away. And of course it's easier to stay home and rent something. I've, I, I never do it, but as human beings, we're still going to want to do the joint thing. And no matter what the the the, the money, the heart, the heartless money men try to tell us what to do, we have still human instincts, and they will remain. Well, I won't disagree with that. And uh, you know, two weeks ago, my wife took me off to see Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And part of the reason was Crosby, Stills, and Nash can't appear on ten thousand stages at exactly the same time. Whereas in this case, how content is delivered commercially is in the hands of a distributor. It's not in the hands of the consumer. Yeah, but, but Chapin, um, the, uh, the Cineplexes, the, the Cinemalls have attempted to, through a couple of the digital companies, show a concert on 10,000 screens at the same time. And if you've ever gone to a concert that's on the, in a movie They're theater, horrible. it's soulless. <laughs> It's soulless. It um, and that is never. It's never going to be replaced. It, this, people are going to go to the movies first of all because they got to get out of the house, you know. And there's and and you and and, num and number two, you can't afford to get out of the house anymore because if you go to a Crosby, Stills and Nash concert, you make a lot of money, so you can afford the. How much was the ticket? How much was the ticket? Two hundred dollars. Okay, for cross. Okay. Five dollars at the State Theater <laughs> to go see a movie. So the I'll movies, go. the movies, because we, our society has been turned into a society of tens of millions of people you know, scrambling for the crumbs, having very little money, living from paycheck to paycheck. The only time the poor and the working class and the former middle class can get out of the house and have a date or a night off or whatever is that they can't afford five or eight or ten dollars. And I so that gives them the, the chance to do that. The state theater anytime, no matter what. Unfortunately, it costs a lot more for me to come out to the state theater than it does to go and see a Crosby, Stills and Nash concert. And the problem is there are not very many theaters in the country that have the mission that the state theater does. And you know, for many of us, and one, there was a Newsweek article that came out a bunch of years ago uh, in which the comment was made that for those of us that are um, over 50, going to a multiplex is, going, is, is basically going into an unsafe environment. They don't feel safe. They don't want to be there because, you know, they're standing in line to go see uh, Marigold Hotel next to, the, next to the crowd of people that are going to see Hackam and Chopham 10. And they don't, they're uh, not comfortable there. Let me they just, don't uh, want to be there. Well, okay, well, okay. Well, I don't know who those people are, but my people, um, <laughs> you know. I'm when, one of your people. Okay, well, when I'm in New York and um, uh, there's a film uh, like The Dark Knight or Avengers or whatever, or Iron Man comes out, and I, want, and I like those movies and I want to go to one of those movies, I actually prefer to go to what I think will be the rowdiest theater. And, 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 Fort, Fort, and this is a, a statistic that isn't offered very much, you know, African Americans make up 11 to 12 percent of our population. They make up 27 to 28 percent of our movie going population. And, and I, I, you aren't going to get this experience here in Traverse City, but if you, if you go to the Magic, Magic Johnson Theater in Harlem uh, to, on opening night of, 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 of uh, Batman, um, uh, number one, no one's going to pull a gun out and shoot 70 people in the black neighborhood, in the black theater, number one. But, but really, the, the, it's like if you've been to a black church on a Sunday, it is just alive. And, and I love the fact that their people are communicating with the screen. They're talking to Batman. And it's just, I, I don't mind that. I mean, I like, I mean, you know, I mean, I, 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 so I don't know if that's such a, a bad thing. I, I, I wish you got out of the house more and went to the movies. <laughs> You know, you said, <laughs> your wife was applauding that. Well, 
My, my wife and I agree on a whole lot of things, and I still believe that going to a movie theater, watching a movie, whether it's 35 millimeter or whether it's digital, is the way to watch a movie. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not a believer nor an advocate for delivery of digital content to the home as a replacement. My fear is that because it now is easy to do it, some smart suit is going to be sitting in Hollywood and say, you know, why do we need theaters for I could, you know, we're already sending it out. No, over the no, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're not possible. It would be like somebody saying, "What do we need restaurants for?" Everybody's got a kitchen in their house. <laughs> you know, it. There will always people will always. This is the if you just step back from it, if you were a Martian looking at this, humans on Earth, even though they have a kitchen where they can make the meal, eighty percent cheaper, they go to the restaurant and sit two feet from a stranger who's <laughs> chomping on f some big piece of beef. <laughs> I don't even know this person. I don't know that person or that person. And and we do, people do, they love to do this. Why do they love to do this? Because I think as so as our species, as animals, we're social animals. Do we are like not wired to be. like a restaurant with a guy on a cell phone? No, but the, but the, but the, the guy, but see, that's less and less these days. See, you haven't got out of the house lately. <laughs> when, when, no, no, sir, what no. am I doing here? When, when, <laughs> when, <laughs> When cell phones first came about, it was horrible. It was annoying. But, but the, the social, what do you call that? The peer pressure. The society took care of it. You would get the dirty look. You would get the, people now know if they, it's on vibrate, it goes off, excuse me, and they leave the table. I've been bettered by my betters, and I concede the point. <laughs> however, however right, well, I will, I, I, you know, all I can tell you is I have this fear, and I hope I live long enough to see that you're right. You will. <laughs> um, Only 18. <laughs> why don't we open it up uh, to the audience here? Just before we do, you brought up something, though, Chapin, in that last, uh, um, um, your point you wanted to make about the, people feel uh, danger when they go to the theater. I thought you were going to make a, a point about Aurora. Um, but d does anyone on this stage, uh, uh, this doesn't really have to do with film versus digital, but uh, I'm just curious, in these few weeks since Aurora, have you noticed, have you heard of people, uh, is anyone, is, are people a little, a little more ed on, on edge uh, or afraid? Have you heard, uh, is that, or maybe you, because um, um, I know I, w I was watching a movie in, in the state the other night, and somebody in the alley um, was trying to get in the door, and I, there was just this lot, it was a big metal door in, behind the screen. Bam, 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 bam. And I gotta tell you, I just kind of, you know, went like this. And uh, I don't know, if it, does anybody wanna add anything to this or say anything about it, or is it, we're just gonna just ignore it and hope it goes away? I think the solution is to ban costumes from movie theaters. <laughs> um, but to a degree, I think we may be having a bit of people not wanting to fly after a plane crash. And although we all have to be more careful about our persons and the environment that we're in than 50 years ago, we certainly all have more care and concern about what our children are doing. Um, there's a, I, I still think that a movie theater is one of uh, the safest places to be, um, even as, uh, as a, uh, even, even with what happened uh, in Aurora, the thing that scared me the most about Aurora, uh, in some ways uh, as tragic and as horrible as the event was, was the couple that came out of that movie theater with their, uh, what was it, an eight-month-old child, and saying, oh, thank heavens, my child was saved. Do they have any idea what would happen to that child's ears? sitting and they're hearing, sitting in a theater, listening to the dark night. Is the, I mean, I don't want to say anything about parenting. I'm a parent myself, but you see it all the time. People take their kids. I had recurring dreams uh, for probably 20 years of a movie that I'd seen that I'd never remembered. And it was a scene from a, from a movie called Night of the Hunter. I saw it when I was 10 years old. My My dad loved... Charles Lawton. I dreamed that dream until I saw that movie again. What happens, what happens to the kids? I, I, there was this wonderful piece that was written by uh, Stephen King uh, about going to see The Passion of the Christ. And this 
child sitting in front of him that was five years old. Is, is, that to me is the tragedy that got shown by this horror that happened out in Aurora. Let me just, 30 seconds, uh, a bit of a retort to that. Um, um, when I was making Roger Me, um, I was on unemployment. I was getting $98 a week. Um, we had uh, a young child and uh, we could not afford a babysitter. And the only way we could get out of the house and go to the movies is to bring her. And I think you see this more and more now because of the economic situation. People are having to bring their kids because they can't afford the, you know, any other way uh, to do this. So I think it has a lot to do, the rise in this has a lot to do with not just bad parenting, but the, but the economic situation has just forced parents, if they want to get out, they've got to take the kids with them. And whenever I see that in the theater, I always, you know, most parents, they, they'll sit in the back, the kid starts to cry or whatever, they take them out in the lobby like at church. Okay, who's first? Go ahead, Bev. Oh, hi, yeah, thank you so much. Oh, this is fascinating, you guys. Thank you so much. Um, I'm from Hollywood, California. And uh, my father worked at Walt Disney Studios in the 30s, and he was a film editor on Pinocchio and Bambi, and you know, used to come home and say, say bird, you know. <laughs> and uh, my first toy was a yellow film core. And uh, I'm a producer my whole life. I produce television commercials. I've seen every incarnation of every, uh, you know, transferring the film to two inch tape. And, and now I shoot on this thing. I am so scared. I have a hundred hours of Occupy Wall Street footage on SD cards. I can't afford partitioned RAID hard drives, five of them, which is what you need. What does a person like me, a person, do to save the history that I, or anything precious in my baby pictures? What, uh, does, I mean, do you have any advice? Hard drives are, they're, if we're getting back to the film, those hard drives to buy are getting cheaper and cheaper. You can buy a terabyte drive now for a couple hundred and, dollars, and which is way cheaper than if we you have a film. Of, we film have a film of hers uh, in the festival here. Yeah, we spoke last night. Yeah, and and you edited that, I believe, on your laptop, is I, I, right? Uh huh. iMovies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so don't 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 fall. Don't listen. To, again, these are a lot of techie guys. You gotta you gotta spend tens of thousands of dollars. They have this, especially you know this uh, new hard drive thing. Jig. You are on the right track. You're not. That's. You could probably buy a, a few hard drives, back it up in a couple places, and then if you can put it up on you know, on a Dropbox or cloud or something like that, and just have it in three different ways and. That guy's crazy. Well, that's why you have it. You know, you have it three different places, and you take the time and and you move it to new drives and you migrate. I mean, it's what you have to do. Film. Everyone talks about. You know, it's a, it is a great archival medium. There's no doubt. But there's been plenty of films that were not stored properly, and you know that that have disappeared and burnt and gotten moldy and decayed it's you know something i think lana wachowski we were talking to in in my doc and she said you know if something's important to us we find a way to save it and if it's not we find a way to lose it so now over there thank you cindy <clears throat> hi um i was at uh, your movie last night side by side i thought it was really interesting and one of the things that was brought up was like what do uh what are they teaching at film schools today as far as this whole uh, film versus digital thing, and I'm actually a, going to be a sophomore film student at Ohio University, <clears throat> and I think that the way that they do it is actually pretty smart because it's a three-year program, and during your first year, um, you have to make three films on actual celluloid film with different restrictions, like on what sort of lighting equipment you can use and things like that, and then during the, your second and third year, you, you're allowed to shoot on digital for like your bigger thesis films and stuff like that. I was just wondering what you guys thought of that method and how you think like uh, student filmmaking and uh, teaching at universities is going to change with this, uh, the death of celluloid, if that's going to happen and all that. 
I think that sounds great, and that happens in many film schools around the world. That's what happens in the Beijing Film School, for Film Academy, for example. And the reason that's good, I think, is because uh, the creative process benefits both from total liberty, shooting digitally and every other way, but also with, with complete restriction. That's the way Lars von Trier and the dogma movement worked, by absolutely restricting the palette, like a painter restricts her or his palette. So that kind of total liberty of shooting digital, but also shooting on celluloid with limitations both are good to get your creative juices going. I, I wish that um, editing uh, was in, uh, maybe it is in your film school, um, that you learn to edit first on a movieola or a Steenbeck um, because it is a different thought process. And I'm really glad that my first uh, film or two was, was you know, done that way. I mean, I like the way it is now, but there was just something about it too that always reminds me with digital to slow down. Don't just hit that fast forward where then you don't see the information because on a steam back when you want to fast forward it's going by you on the screen you go that's right we got that let's let's there's, there's that shot um you know it's a little that's a small example but um um yes yes right here um something that i've um paying attention to a lot here is um a generational thing um as a person who taught at university in an art department and in a, I used the first computer in 1987, and I'm, I have floppy drives too. And um, I'm listening to you all, um, and the elders and the young bloods, and, and how, um, um, how do I say this? How important it is for uh, the, who's come before to bring along those who come now kind of thing. And that um, I, I was schooled in old process, which I brought to students, and found that if, if you don't understand the old way, the original ways, then you don't make, as I believe, as good a product, uh, and I hate to refer to film as product, but a product uh, if, uh, as if you didn't understand it all. And a person, who, I'm highly steeped in technology, um, so I'm wondering, with the younger men, if you interned or did you apprentice with people um, to help you understand, um, you know, because I think both Chapin and Bill offer stuff that you'll never find in school. So did you apprentice Alex, or you did you just go on your own? No, I never, I never shot a frame of film in my life. I, I couldn't tell you how to operate a film camera, a Bolex, a 60, any type of film camera. I just don't know how to do it. I've never been taught, which I'm sure is creating pain to my right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, I, did, you know, I didn't go to school for film. I went to grad school for uh, anthropology, and I came into you know, video making, I guess, uh, later. But I did work for five years as a karaoke video editor. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so that was my training, I guess, if you want to call it that. But, I, I, you know, we, and then I kind of moved on to corporate videos and industrial videos. And, I, you know, I spent a lot of time. But you are sort of, you know, I, 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 I don't necessarily agree with Michael that we need to be taught with moviolas and steambacks. But I do believe, uh, maybe a sister thought to that, that I think it's very helpful for any director to know how to edit before he can go on. And, and, and it boggles my mind that the, these filmmakers show up on set sometimes and they don't know the basics of editing. So my training was just sort of making these weird little karaoke videos, but it did teach me, even in that strange uh, context, it did teach me a few, I, it, it taught me how to edit, but it also taught me how to just, you know, weave narratives in a visual sense, which was very helpful. As the uh, oldest youth on this, on this panel, um, if I could, I'd like to address that a bit from my perspective. Uh, when I trained as a projectionist, a union projectionist in 1965, it was all on the job training. Uh, you walked into a movie theater, you worked with an old Irish guy who had been there from the, when the dawn of sound, and I learned everything that I learned that you see on the screens here, whether it's digital or film, that I have responsibility for from those old guys in the 60s. And the problem is that there aren't very many people who are interested in why film speed and the, in the silent eras ran and the speed that they did. But I consider it my mission to try and pass on a, a long, along as much of that information as I can. 
Um, we have a young man who here who is part of our tech crew who is 22 years old. He learned how to line up the sound on 35 millimeter projectors at this festival last year. Um, there is a group uh, called the Art House Convergence uh, that is a loose organization of independent art house theaters of which uh, the State Theater and Deb Lake are an exceedingly active part. Um, and I spend a lot of my time answering questions that people have where they have problems with their 35 millimeter print as well as the problems with their digital exhibition and about anything else anybody will want to listen to. But th thanks for that point. That's a very good point because I, not just with film or art, but you know, schools don't teach handwriting anymore. This whole generation now has no idea how to write in cursive. And I'm guessing that we'll reach a point where they don't teach any writing, even how to print because of the keyboard. And I <clears throat> will say as a writer, that, and I, of course I use a computer, and, but I, initially I use a legal pad um, because there's just something about seeing it in my own handwriting that's, I don't know what it is, but there's just something that's, come, I don't know, I'm not a new age person, but it just feels like it's coming more from my soul. Than, who's next? Um, yes, in the back. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, I'm a neurosurgeon by profession, so I have a busy practice, but I'm a documentary filmmaker by passion. And I uh, many of those many yes. documentary yes slash so neurosurgeon. I, I went to, I, I and and I went to, I went to eight countries and shot a film on uh, AGHX 200. So the convenience of digital camera is unparalleled. It's incomparable, and the cost again is another point. I was in Sweden uh, making a film about healthcare in America as well as in Europe, and I saw a documentary of a. Uh, one of the National Geographic photographer requesting the last Kodak still film reel that's coming out of the assembly line. And he said, can I have it? The economics of the cost of film will be so high that the market forces will determine. And I think uh, it's very hard for it to survive. But the problem Michael already mentioned, which is now everybody makes a film. I'm sure there are films because of the storyline and cinematography will differentiate themselves as better than many other films that are made. But my question to you, Chris, is that you said that they're gonna come up to the surface. The noise is so vast because so many films are made. It is very difficult for even good films that are independently made to be brought to attention for people to be distributed or seen. So for example, uh, the Sundance, which was originally an independent film festival, is not that much of an independent film festival because many, many uh, people uh, uh, produce them with very, very high uh, investment. So, what's, what's your question, Chris? The question is, how do you bring this to the surface, uh, even when you have a good film, right. because of so much noise? There is. There's. There's more films being made now. There's more noise, but there's also more ways to see them, there's more ways to sift through them, there's more ways to exchange information, there's more ways to self-distribute and to let people know. There's, you know, online communities that if your movie falls into a certain niche or certain people would be interested in, it's much easier nowadays to reach out to those people and find specific groups that would be interested to see your movie than there has been in the past. So. I think the technology, as well as making things easier to create, it also allows for easier ways to exchange and um, exhibit and distribute and to find an audience. Well, um, yes. I get to contradict my husband a little bit. Um, <laughs> as one of the founders. Why change now? <laughs> as, as one of the founders of Boston Light and Sound, I started as a still photographer and a, and a uh, photo researcher. Um, I have a comment and a question um, for Chris. Um, the comment is that the technology is here and we are embracing it. And um, Chris and I had a conversation earlier about how, you know, we all rode horses and used wagons and we loved our horses and there were stagecoaches and the mail got around and everything was great. And it changed. And the first horseless carriage that came into town, the roads were terrible and it got stuck. And so in terms of the exhibition and distribution of the new technology may be bumpy 
right now, but it will change, it will improve. It does make it more democratic. I want to see your film. Um, and, uh, and I think that... Yeah. It, I found her film on YouTube. With, on YouTube. Oh, okay. And, and whether, we, whether we mourn the loss or, or rejoice in the, in the loss of, of film, um, it's here and this is the way it is. But my perspective from the work that I've done is that what we're going to need is a new type of archivist. We're going to need digital archivists, I guess. So I would ask Chris, um, is this something that you think We've had we've had film preservationists, Eastman House, for example, and mm -hmm. you talked about yeah. Michael, some of the university. So what's the plan? What, so, yeah. So like, are you starting to see that people are trying to preserve, you know? Yeah, I mean, bridge already, both worlds. Digital technology has already. You mentioned still photography. There's film is done in still photography. The top, you know, even the fashion photographers and and advertising, they they shoot digitally. You know, maybe every once in a while some you know, top-notch guy can say he'll only do it on film, and he has the power to do that, but it's gone. Um, they're archiving things digitally. All the top businesses and banks and governments, they're archiving things digitally. You know, the, the issue with motion pictures is there's just so much information that you have to store, and it's difficult. Um, but computers keep getting bigger and stronger, and cheaper and it's easier to store more information but then they're going to shoot at a higher resolution and then they, they, it's it's always this catch-up game and there's always the obsolescence issue that's to me is the biggest thing it's it's that you know they came out with these tapes called LTO tapes and they're great and supposedly they they can hold digital information for 40 years or 50 years now they're all all the way up to version 5 and the new version 5 deck only plays LTO versions three, four, and five. So if you shot something five years ago on LTO one, you're, you know, you're out of luck. So I don't know what the solution is, but it's, it's kind of going to be that game where we're always chasing the technology. I guess the solution yeah. is being mindful and really caring about it and, and letting people know that archival is an issue and something you have let's to try keep to, your eye on. Let's try to get a few more questions in here uh, just for you. We'll, quick, we'll give you shorter answers uh, so we can... Just okay, I've been a musician question. all my life, and uh, this digital issue has hit our market a long time ago. Uh, live bands have been replaced by DJs a long time ago. Um, uh, the virtual orchestra in, in uh, theaters have been replacing musicians in pit orchestras uh, for a long time. I wanted to uh, ask you a question. If I'm surprised there's no focus on the, the political end of it, the, uh, the um, profit motive here, and a lot of, a lot of artists are out of work are getting paid a lot less than they used to get paid. Now you can get a, a film made so cheap, that means because nobody's getting paid for it. So what do you think about the profit motive? Me? Anybody. Uh, well, <laughs> Michael, too. Yeah, maybe <laughs> films are, you know, each individual film, if it's being shot on digital, is, is hiring less people. But there's way more films being made, so there's way more people, you know, having a chance to work on films. Maybe they're making less money. I don't know, you know, when I came in, it, everything was being shot on film, and I ended up working for free for six months until I finally, you know, someone gave me a, a little amount a week to, to keep working. So, you know, I never saw the big film money myself. Profit motive is the killer, pure and simple, in just about everything. Um, if we, if our mission at the State Theater was to operate at a profit, there'd be no State Theater. If we were motivated to make a profit, we wouldn't charge you $2 for the popcorn and a dollar for the candy. All right, we charge that so you'll come to the movies. Um, and my biggest concern is, and I think Alex will, might echo this, is these, you're seeing some incredible films here this week, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah. <clears throat> well, well more than half of them will never see distribution light of day. And this is where, um, you know, this deserves another panel, but we, this is a big, big problem that so, I see so many of these wonderful movies. Um, and, and because there isn't a, a big enough profit incentive for, for someone, but there is, enough, there is enough out there where everyone would break even and everybody would make a little bit of money. Um, but that's not the way our system is structured. And um, until that changes, uh, that will always be a problem, in my opinion. So. 
if anybody wants to add to that or we'll go on to the next question. Yeah. Following up a little bit on the economic question, I guess I'm interested in the industry, the, sort of the industry as a whole and what this means for all the you know, thousands and thousands of people who've, who've worked in film, I mean film of any kind, in all of the kind of technical aspects of it. And does, will the move to digital mean that there will be just generally much less Yes, work. they've already laid off. The industry will of just people. compress sure. and yeah. yeah. Of course. If they're not making the cameras anymore, they're not making the projectors anymore, and they're not developing film anymore, um, there have been a lot of layoffs. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Over here, let's go off the aisle. Yes. Um, you you've got me scared about this whole film disappearing thing because I've been thinking about books disappearing and all of that. So I'm looking at the big banner behind you and this isn't a suggestion, it's just have you thought about it, changing it to Traverse City Cinema Festival instead of Film Festival? Content. <laughs> what, content festival? <laughs> I think I that... Uh, say, I, get, I get really confused sometimes. We're making a real distinction between digital and film, and yet people keep saying film when they're talking about digital, and I don't even know what they're saying anymore. I think well, we need Mark, to make that Mark and Chris, I don't, my guess is that the word film is morphing itself into meaning Film and it'll like always press. it will not mean celluloid. It'll mean, yeah. Um, actually, pressing you know the news anymore, but you still say yeah, I'm with the press. right. Exactly. Yeah. You don't. Yeah. There's no presses, but you say you're with the press. And I think Alex, when um, you know you're you're going out to shoot today on your set, you're not saying we're going out to video today. We're not going to go videotape we're some stuff. We're going to capture some you're image. You're making a movie, and you're. I'm I'm sorry, but I'm busy filming today. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's the word is the word is safe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but one thing, if I could make a quick interjection here on uh, as far as, as uh, I, I know a few archivists and, and from my understanding is that still the best way to preserve film is on film and not digitally. Yeah, I th yes, I agree. And I think film is what I'm still doing going with, to be made. It's what I'm doing with my... Uh, you know, with Roger Me, now I'm going to do it for all my films. I'm going to do it very quickly, but I, but not, but I really also want to lead a movement to. Um, uh, we're going to be in this digital era. I think this is great. I think it's helped. It's been all for all the reasons we've said here today, and I've learned some other things that I. I it's, it's been a really good panel, but I, but, yeah, but 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 it it. I really am going to really push for. Uh, everybody who uh, wants their film uh, that's been shot on digital preserved. Right now, at least, we know that film will last 100 plus years, and uh, and I, I, why you, we have no idea how long any of this digital stuff will last. We just don't know. Why would we take the risk of losing our our art uh, like this? So I think, I, at the very least, there should be money or put in the budget or whatever. But the we have got to keep these movies on celluloid at least for now. Um, Even. Uh the major Hollywood studios that are making their content digitally and distributing it digitally, uh, the last step is to make a three-strip black and white uh, copy of every major film that comes out, uh, along with a 35 millimeter check print to make sure the registration between the three strips is accurate. Uh, so the role of film may be changing instead of being an archive uh, instead of being an exhibition format but this is a debate that goes on with the archives the archivists as to how to continue to distribute film uh, because people may actually want to see Casablanca as a film rather than seeing it as electronic um, but Katie two more was, um, Katie's raising her hand two more quick there. questions uh, here um, yes where there's an archivist right there who right. wants Go to Go ahead, speak. yes, yes. No, I, yes, I, I, I um, manage the motion picture collection at the Museum of Modern Art, and we're still very much committed to preserving films photochemically. Um, I'm just reaffirming everything you're saying up there. I want to leave room for questions, but I just want to say that we're, uh, as long as film is being made, we'll preserve on film. And although we're embracing digital mediums coming in, and we, this is a very huge challenge for us, is how to create a digital repository and to, you know, migrate digital uh, mediums that are coming into the museum. But uh, most of the archives are still very committed. The the top five archives in the country on preserving on film. So be rest assured, your cultural heritage is safe in our hands. <laughs> yeah, Thank, <hey>. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Last question. Um, 
I live in Washington, D.C., near the Avalon Theater, which is independent, and they get their foreign films in the diplomatic pouches from Czechoslovakia or wherever, which is the best use of diplomatic pouches ever. But um, my question is, and I think you might have touched on it a little, is do you think there's an actually different way of seeing from a director, you know, when they're filming in film versus digital? Um, because of the speed of it, because of the ability to improvise or not so much, but also just the way it looks on the screen. Do you think that directors or movie makers envision their movies differently? Uh, I've made two films on Super 16, which is the closest to 35 that I've gotten. So, uh, and I remember holding my breath when the film was running through the camera. I now shoot digitally and I hold my breath when it's running through the camera. It's the, the idea of the, the shot, the frame, the aesthetic, the moment matters to me just as much, whether it's digital or film. One of the big differences between film and digital that we didn't touch on is when you are capturing, with film, you don't know exactly, exactly if you got it or what it's going to look like until it comes out of the camera, goes to the lab, gets developed, they make a print, and you go the next day and watch it, and then you're like, oh great, we got it, or oh, we screwed it up, we have to do that all, all again. With digital, one of the huge advantages, I think, is that while you're shooting it, you are seeing what you're shooting. You know, not the size of a, a theater screen, but you have an idea of, of and we'll exactly fix it what it's post. going to look like. Pardon? And we'll fix it in post. Exactly, yeah. So you just shoot whatever you want, you don't care about it because you're not worried, and you just hose it down, and then when you edit, you have hours and hours of crap to go through. You so that's you a major advantage. The only, thing, the only thing I would kind of add to that is, unfortunately, the way things look on a, uh, on a flat screen uh, is very different than the way it looks in a movie theater. And it's amazing at film festivals, in particular, how many people show up uh, that have made um, you know, wonderful films that have never seen it on a screen like this, and they're surprised at what they see because it's very different than what they've seen before. So that is still a concern and a caution. Right, and I agree with what Bill said about Rory Rogers uh, last year. We we showed a Rory Rogers film uh, uh, from a DVD, skies. and we and we showed one that we had, that we paid for the restoration because it, it had disappeared. Um, the film festival has done that for a number of films. Um, over the years uh, that we've brought. Hair does not exist as a movie. So we paid uh, to have the only print that exists of that. And I th think, do we keep that at, at MoMA? Or oh, she's gone, I think. Uh, um, I, think it went to, uh, I think it went to the UCLA. Film UCLA, film. OK. Um, and uh, we're doing it for Johnny Got His Gun, because there are no prints of that uh, film available. Um, so this is one of our missions here, too. But I want to tell you. Um, uh, I did notice the difference, and I, you know, this when I hear this vinyl versus uh, CD, and people say I can tell the difference. I swear to God, if I put, if I blindfold them and play, you know, Led Zeppelin Zoso, um, I don't really think they'll know which which is which. The people claim they do, but but I'll tell you, Roy Rogers on that 35 millimeter. Oh my God! From the day before when we saw the other one on video, completely different. Completely image. different. And that was I, HD cam too, wasn't it? Or was? It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, it wasn't a. D, it wasn't a DVD, right? It was. It, uh, so, um, boy, I don't know how to uh, close this out with another happy song. Uh, <laughs> One other example, Michael, when a few years back and we did hear the complete Kubrick retrospective, all on film. We did that our second year, all on film, right. It was incredibly gorgeous, and, yeah. and some of those prints Spartacus. needed to be restored. I think Spartacus yeah. took a revisor two days to get it into a screening capability, but... But, um, but again, in other words, we wanted to show a Spartacus, and they didn't have something that we could show. Yeah. On film, um, and and I while we were watching all these Kubrick films on films, I thought, "Geez, this is the last time we're gonna." Doctor Strange Love see this. The, uh, one of the original prints from the '60s that was still on the acetate film, and that one was a challenge too. But uh, last year at another festival. Um, Alec Baldwin was going to present something that inspired him as a young man, and he wanted to present Barry Lyndon. Um, they had a DVD for us, and um, I knew we had done the Kubrick retrospective here, and, and so um, Deb 
actually gave me a contact number to give to that festival. They talked to Warner Brothers. Even though we were going into a restored, beautiful movie palace, 1,200 people, uh, seat theater. It had uh, a pair of century projectors that are kept up. They do retrospectives all year long. We had the same projectionists that were here. They would not give us a print of Barry Lyndon, even though it sat there. And so what they did send, Warner Brothers, was a Blu-ray that was formatted to 185 aspect ratio, and Kubrick insisted it was 166. And Barry Lyndon was shot on film, those special camera with the light, beautiful, incredible. We couldn't, I w refused to show the Blu-ray because it was the wrong aspect ratio. We ended up showing a DVD from Swank, which was the 166 aspect ratio, to 1,200 people a sold out house, and there they were denied a cinematic experience like what we had with Roy Rogers last year because they had to show it on DVD, and Alec Baldwin was very upset. So what do you think about that, Mark? <laughs> and you'll get the last word. <laughs> I think, I'm looking at, there are some really young people in the audience here, I can see young people. I, I, I wish I was your age because this is a time of plenitude. It's never been a better time to be a cinephile, a movie lover. We can see more films now. If you want to see the great Ethiopian films that were made in the 70s, you can do so. And that's partly because of the digitizing of the film process. Well, one of these young people would like to say something. Yes. We have a microphone over there. Yep. And, then, and this will be the last word. Thank you. Um, what advice uh, would you give um, to young filmmakers, just each of you who are growing up in the digital age, really have um, like no or like limited means? It's practically impossible to get an analog, just a film camera. Like, uh, what advice uh, would you give um, just young filmmakers who have no choice but to film digitally, just like progress with the art? My advice after this whole discussion about technology and cameras and things like that is, to me, it kind of doesn't matter. If you have a great story to tell and you're passionate about it, go out and do it with whatever. Don't worry that it's not the greatest camera or it's low resolution or this and that. I mean, make a great story and people will sit through some really... Put 99% of your focus on the story yeah. and have it come from the heart and, and be honest to yourself into the art. Thank Remember. you, everybody. Thanks, everybody here on the panel for being here. We appreciate it. Tomorrow morning's panel, Vim Vendors. Never bear. Keep that in your heart while you're.